Warm welcome, everyone. Uh, not from a conference room um, in snowy Davos, but for me in a cow barn north of Berlin and my colleagues in Dubai and San Francisco and London. Uh, very happy to be with you all on this um, really profound topic. Um, Davos is such an interesting place where we talk everything from foreign policy to education reform, but here we're going to go both to the heart and the policy of two things that are important to all of us. And that is, what are we learning about happiness, joy, and creating meaning, knowing that not everyone's in a happy, joyful place right now during this COVID-19 crisis, and why does it matter? So to get us started, before I even introduce uh, our panelists, we're gonna ask you that question, and there'll be a Slido that comes up where we wanna find out from you as an individual. It could be as an individual as your uh, role in business or as a parent or, as a, as a child or as a caregiver or as a student or as a learner. Um, what's the biggest insight you've had about yourself in this introspection about happiness, joy, and creating meaning during COVID? And again, this is anonymous, so you can say if it's hard, it doesn't always have to be bright and shiny. So if you can go ahead and go into that Slido, they're gonna put up a QR code and put a um, link in the, in the chat. And we're gonna come back and look at those results in just a minute. But let me go ahead um, and introduce our panelists. So they're each gonna answer that question for themselves. So Tally Shira, Tally, could you give us a, a warm wave there? Um, here she is. She's the professor of cognitive neuroscience at UCL in London. I could say so much about each of these people. You can look them up on TopLink or on the internet. But Tally, in 30 seconds, what's been the biggest insight you've had about yourself? Um, hi, everyone. So, um, yeah, I think that there's things that I gained that I didn't do or have before during the pandemic, but there's also things that I lost that I now realize were quite important. And I'm going to give you an example of the latter. Um, so as someone who doesn't live in their home country, the inability to travel home for such a prolonged time, especially in a time of crisis, is psychologically quite hard. And for me, it really highlighted the important connection a person has to the place they're from and the importance of the connection to their well-being, security, um, and sense of belonging. Uh, there's no place like home, Dorothy said. Um, that's been something very, very important for me, not being able to go home. So thank you for that, Tally. Um, Allison um, Gopnik, now I'm gonna do a little bit further than just giving you her name and, um, and title. She is the professor at University of California, Berkeley, but a very important person in my life because her book about gardening and being a carpenter has shaped how I raise my children. So it's such an honor and thanks for having an impact on my family's like Allison. So how about you? What have you learned about yourself during this time? So I think I've learned two things. One of them is that it's possible to be just as nuts about a new grandchild over the internet and over Zoom and over constant video feedback almost as much as if you've actually got them in real life. So my latest grandson was born uh, just four months ago. Um, and then the other thing that I learned is my my husband is, you know, 77, he's vulnerable, he's got half a lung, he's one of the fragile people. And I was amazed at what a dragon I became about uh, taking care of him and protecting him and things that I would never have thought that I would do, like disinfect the entire kitchen, um, were things that felt as if they were very natural and very much the right um, sort of things to do, even if it turns out we didn't really quite have to do it. So, so the capacity to have those incredibly strong emotions, even in these kind of very restrained circumstances and even over the internet, uh, I was surprised by. So from care, pa care bearer digitally to dragon, you've been able to have both of those feelings. Um, fantastic, um, Allison. Um, and Alex Liu is the managing partner and chairman of Kearney Inc. Um, I know he thinks a lot about joy in business, which we'll hear um, much more about, but what did you learn about yourself, Alex? It wouldn't be a conference, no. even at Davos, without mute issues. So go ahead. No, I got it. I got it now. Thanks, Lisa. Congratulations, Allison, on the grandchild. That's great. Um, I mean, for me, I've gotten some meaning and joy from uh, the power of communication. Uh, this has been a period of intense and hyper con con communication. And I, I found that expressing yourself, telling your stories, um, that it's okay to not be okay, to be optimistic and realistic. And I've got a global company and there are people all ages and demographics and geographies. People can feel connected and they feel it's okay to tell their own stories and to be able to bond and connect. So I think I, you know, in expressing how I felt, how I'm coping and caring during all these crises, um, you know, allowed people to also feel, you know, you're not alone. So let's go ahead and take a look at what uh, the participants say that they've learned about themselves. Um, if the great 
folks at WEF can pull up that Slido. Let's just take a quick look about how people are feeling. Are they feeling more dragon or Care Bear? Are they like Tally um, and homesick? Um, let's see here. It's a bit hard to see. It's a bit small. Maybe we'll come back to that. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that. Let's let's go sort of keep keep going. Uh, make it smooth as we can. So here we're going to go around Robin of three important questions about COVID-19 and joy and meaning making during this time. Um, so the first question I'm going to ask you, um, Allison, you're a researcher. Um, you think a lot about this. What are we learning about joy and meaning making right now? Well, I think in terms of the science, it's that it's timely in that uh, the crisis has made us realize something that we we're sort of already realizing scientifically, which is the importance of care and caregiving and taking care um, for human evolution, for the human brain. Uh, so the kind of traditional way of thinking about the evolution of, of human society has been this kind of social contract view. So, you know, we trade off, it's tit for tat, I do this for you, you do that for me, we negotiate. And that's true, that has been part of our evolution. But an even more central part of our evolution is the evolution of caregiving, the evolution of simply extending our own utilities, our own goals to another human being. And what we've learned is that this ability to do that, the ability to extend what you, what you're, what's important to you to care about someone else is central to human evolution. So humans evolved a much longer period of childhood, of helplessness. Uh, in childhood than, than any other species. And we also evolved this period of elderhood from about 50 to 70, which again, we don't see in chimps and other species, for example. And we evolved a much wider range of caregivers. So we have many more people taking care of our children and taking care of our children cooperatively. And we also have these unique elders who both care for our children and need care themselves. So it was as if there was this giant expansion of what, from an evolutionary perspective, started out just being, say, you know, a mother vole or a mother mouse having to take care of a, a, an infant. That same neurophysiology, that same, uh, that those same capacities got generalized so that we could take care of a whole range of different children. We could take care of elders and we could take care of the other people around us. So the science, I think, has really changed our picture from this sort of social contract picture of social life to this caregiving picture being really central to social life. And of course, COVID has made the significance of that caregiving, both for children and for elders, incredibly vivid in an everyday uh, in an everyday way. Great. So we're going to come back in the next round about why it matters. You began to touch about that, but why this insight on care, why it matters, and then eventually what we can do about that to, to, to drive that forward in, in a number of ways. Alex, I'm going to go next to you on, from your perspective, um, through your research, through your work, what are we learning about joy and meaning making right now? And maybe a couple of points. One, I think even before 2020 and the crazy events of last year, there was a purpose gap. There was a joy gap. You look at ethno research across demographies, uh, an epidemic of mental health issues, stigmatization, people feeling isolated even in a technology world. So it was accelerated during the last year. Uh, but going forward, it's still a structural opportunity. I mean, my premise is that why settle for anything less than joy? at your work or in your organizations, you're born happy, uh, you go to school happy, you go to work happy, and then something happens. You know, what happened? And I think that leads to the second point, which is I've learned through this year in particular, leading an organization is that leadership and culture make a big difference. You know, you set the tone, you set the agenda, um, you set the example sometimes, um, and you can reframe the uh, definition, a broader definition of well-being. The individual well-being, you know, feeling connected to your teams, but also to the broader community, like joy and justice go hand in hand. And then within the corporate environment that you can control, um, aspirationally to, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, you know, the aspirational parts of your culture, how can we increase a sense of belonging and inclusion? So I'll leave it at that and come to some of the other questions later. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, just a quick a quick follow up. Um, I've noticed in conversations with business leaders that they've seen some performers um, who have had you know exhibited or communicated sort of mental health or anxiety in the workplace. Many of those folks 
um, really rising and, and finding joy in this new way of working because they say it's normal that everybody is anxious. It used to be only me. Have you seen that? Have you seen that other sometimes where people were less joyful or had more anxiety have balanced out? I'm sure the opposite can be true, but have you seen that change in people where they made meaning or? That is, the re I mean, the reality is we're all so different. Our brain diversity, individual diversity, in fact, 90% of diversity is not visible. It's invisible. It's not age, race, and gender. It's you know how you look at the world. So I think you're right. I mean, the technology now has allowed us to be able to communicate differently, but some people like to communicate by writing or by a phone call. Um, the key to me and what I've seen is that all, all people want to be safe and seen, psychologically safe as well as physically safe, seen and supported for who they are so they can bring themselves to work, even if they have a stigma of something that they can't quite express. And it's up to the leaders to actually inspire a culture where it's okay to be yourself. That's good enough. And, and I think that's where you get joy in the culture, right? People feel like they have each other's back. Mm. Tally, I'm going to go to you at the University of College London. You're a researcher. Um, what, what are you learning about joy and meaning? And is there anything um, that might not be obvious or counterintuitive about what we're learning right now? Mm -hmm. So I think the most, uh, the strongest, maybe surprising and optimistic finding was the incredible human resilience during this time and the quick adaptation. So when we uh, looked at people's happiness and well-being back in March, when everything was starting, there was a significant decrease in happiness and increased stress. But within only one month, um, it went back to baseline levels of happiness, which is quite incredible. Um, and we were interested in how people did that, right? Um, so what we did was actually, we looked at millions of web searches to try to figure out what people were doing. Um, and we found that people um, turned to knowledge to help them. So they were asking a lot of why and a lot of what, and they wanted to know more about the virus and more about health, but they're also asking a lot of how. How do I help? That was a big one. Um, how do I use Zoom? How do I make a, a mask out of socks? and how do I make my own margarita? Um, but I, it's also important to note that this is kind of a bird's eye view because there is a significant minority that we're not adapting, that we're struggling. And I think um, an important thing is to focus our resources on those subpopulations. So those who are left out, um, thank you, Tally. So, so fascinating, the role of agency. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about post-traumatic growth and resilience and what we're learning from this. So I'd love to hear more about this. So Allison, we're gonna go back to care and what we're learning about care, the spotlighting of care or lack of care um, and what that means to the global economy. Why what, you're, what we're learning now about care matters and what do we need to do about it to not make it a sort of a blip? We had this moment in COVID, we learned about care. How does this, how does this learning stay permanent? What should stay permanent about it? Yeah, I mean, I think as with so many other things about COVID, it's just heightened things that were already problematic in the society. So the fact that we need to care for our young people, for children and for elders, and that we don't do a very good job of this, even in very uh, rich developed societies, that's been true for a long time. And taking care of children, taking care of elders, taking care of people who are ill, they just don't fit into our general picture about say what markets could do or what, or even what states could do. One of the things that I've found incredibly moving in COVID is over and over again, you hear this interview where they're talking to an elder care worker and the elder care workers are the least well paid. You know, they're doing this miserable job. It's hard. It doesn't get any pay. It doesn't get any respect. They're often going to three or four places at once. And, and it's dangerous now. And they'll ask, why are you doing it? And they'll say, well, it's that one guy, you know, it's Mr. It's Mr. Smith who I take care of and he's such a nice guy. And if I wasn't there to take care of him, he'd just be so miserable. It's that specific relationship between a specific person and the specific person that they care for that's really underpinning these, this amazing moral heroism that we're getting a chance to see over and over again. And on the other end, of course, we're seeing that with all the people who are staying home, taking care of uh, taking care of children. So both of those things, I think, are, are clearly really foundational to our, our moral lives, foundational to what gives our lives meaning. And in some ways, it seems sort of almost contradictory, like how could it be that something so hard without any obvious sort of reciprocation, without any negotiation, like taking care of someone who's really fragile and, and ill or dying, how, why is it that that would give us this deepest sense of of meaning. So I think it really does matter. And it's 
as often it's sort of invisible. Uh, it doesn't show up in, those things don't show up in the GDP, right? Um, the way that individual people love and care for each other is, is kind of out there in the world of songs and sermons, not the world of policy. So I'm gonna ask a follow-up question quickly to you, Allison. Um, you've talked about the, the joy of care and meaning making people had for individuals. Um, a lot of people are choosing not to wear masks, which one person could, you could say, well, that's not showing care. Do you have any thoughts about sort of the lack of care and non-mask wearing? Any advice around uh, messaging, around using a care messaging? Will that work, will that not? Well, I think one of the things that's sort of paradoxical that makes care difficult is because it is about individual people and the people that they're close to, the people they love. This gets back to Tally's point about homesickness. And the paradox forever has always been, how can we scale that up, right? So everybody feels like the people that are their people, their children, their elders, those are people who they really desperately need to take care of. You wouldn't really be human if you didn't have some of that feeling. But then the question is, how about all the other people? How could we scale up that sense of altruistic care that we feel for our, our parents or our, our children to the scale of a of an entire society. And you could think about, you know, markets and democracies, the great inventions of the enlightenment, they were really ways of scaling up contracts. They're ways of scaling up the individual negotiations about I'll do this for you if you do that for me. But the question is, is there some way we could scale up that sense that, no, you belong to me, you're part of me, of course I'm gonna care for you. And I think a lot of the non-mask wearing is because people feel like, well, okay, you, this other, doesn't really belong to me. You're not part of my group. You're not one of the people that I have an obligation to care for. And I think that's a, a really deep challenge is how could we, how could we scale up the way that we feel? It's, by the way, it's an, an old tradition in uh, Asian philosophy. People like Mencius said, how could, I, how could I take the way I feel about my brother and make that be a way that I feel about uh, the entire state, for example, all of China? I, I um, work with governments around the world that co-founded an organization called Apolitical, and we hear day in, day out, these are the big sort of psychological challenges that, that, that societies have. And interestingly, some governments have a behavioral scientist or a cognitive scientist sort of advising them on messaging, but not all do. And I think we'd be, we'd all be better off if we understood some of the psychology and insights that um, Alex Talley and, and Allison um, have. Alex, I'm going to go back to you. So you talked about, you know, um, the workplace and some of the things we're learning about the differences and how people are, are thriving or not. What does this matter? What's going to stay permanent? What should people do to make these changes permanent or not? Right. Well, first, I love the thoughts earlier about empathy and resilience, because I think they apply to the broader. How does this, how do we, you know, activate that in the workplace also? I mean, I've seen a couple of things. One, there is a generational shift around more meaning and joy in the work we pursue. Uh, in the companies that we work for and the values that we want them to espouse and actually be the difference on. So you see that in millennials, Generation Z, uh, Generation X, I'm probably the last baby boomer in my company and they, they want me to stand up and make sure that we stand for something that makes a difference. That links to another part, which is stakeholder capitalism. I mean, hu huge theme at Davos. You know, it's not just about you and your company or your PL, it's about the impact on communities and the climate uh, prosperity of next generation. So I think that's very important of why this matters too, being doing this together. And then from a pure business and human case, they go together. Um, if you can unlock the productivity and energy, the latent energy, there's a 50% joy gap from the research that I've seen and we've done uh, across the world. Um, that's powerful. That means employees are satisfied. They stay with the companies, even though they have the chance to work in six or seven these days in their lifetime, not just one company forever. Um, it means that they will be better advocates for your products and services, so you have better customer relationships. So it's a win-win if we get the culture aspect down uh, right and supported by the right leadership and values. That's why it matters. I love this idea that joy pays, um, pays dividends, um, the, the, the joy dividend. I think a lot about this in parenting, though, that sometimes um, you have to do things that don't bring joy, that are just really hard. You have to knuckle down. So I'd love to hear any of you talk about um, the downside of joy sometimes, if, if there is any of that. Tally, I, I feel like you're sitting on a gold mine of insight, a, a bit more insight into your research about what we're learning about joy and meaning. So an invitation to talk a little bit more about that, but then also why does it matter and, and how do we make some insights that you have um, touched on more? 
Yeah. So, so actually, before I do that, I'll just chip in on this conversation that you had with Allison, because in fact, our data shows that the number one predictor of um, uh, doing kind of taking the behaviors measures that protect uh, ourselves and others was in fact whether you thought other people were in danger rather than yourself. So, um, and, and one of the reasons for this is that people underestimated their own risk, but they didn't underestimate the risk to other people. Um, and it is people who believed others were at greater risk were the ones who were gonna take um, behavioral measures to mitigate the, the risk. Um, so I think that touches nicely kind of to what you were talking about. Um, now, in terms of kind of this uh, idea of resilience and the adaptation, I think there are two things that matter here. One is trying to identify those factors that were supporting resilience because we can then put in policy in place to foster them even further. I'll just give you one example. So one factor that we found was quite uh, important for people's happiness during the pandemic was a sense of control. So those people who felt they had agency over their lives were much happier and much less stress than those who felt their agency was very much restricted. And one way to enhance a sense of agency is to give people a choice. Uh, so for example, in some school districts, parents could choose between a hybrid program, in-person program, totally remote program. So I think those kind of initiatives can help. Um, and the other important factor here is to identify those subpopulations that I was talking about that were not adapting in order to focus our assistance on them. And um, what the data shows is that these are um, people from the low uh, income bracket. Um, it tends to be the younger individuals, the older were doing much better, in fact. Um, also, females were doing worse than males. Um, people with predisposition to mental health were not doing as well, um, as well as uh, people who had um, young kids. So if we can characterize those, we can then focus our uh, resources on those populations. It seems like just on that gender analysis or demographic analysis, it ties nicely back into Alice's point about lack of care support or having care support. Um, before, I, I want to go to you, um, Allison, in particular, and ask a policy question where, Tally, you just made some great policy recommendations around agency and choice and communicating others' harm versus yourself, because we tend to um, underestimate our own harm. Some great opportunities there and messaging and, and, and policy. I wanna look quickly, if we can go back at the slide when we asked our participants how they were changing, just taking it back to them after we heard the research. Um, I know we have some great input here on slowing down self-reflection, family, goal setting, but there's also some reflection around loneliness about people feeling um, um, alone. Um, Zoom has its limits. Uh, Microsoft Teams has its limits. Um, I read a study um, today that I can't remember. It was just an outstanding number of people, just crazy, um, hadn't hugged anyone outside of their family and how much we need that, that physical touch. For me, nature has been the, the great um, care bear um, of my soul. So Allison, I'm going to go to you. Um, Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of talk of politics and government. Um, I'm an American. I believe you are an American, too. So we just had this, this big election. I, I um, As I said, my organization, Apolitical and Apolitical Foundation, we work at supporting public service and helping transformational political leaders. What are some political implications that you see coming from this COVID search for joy in me? Well, I think, the, again, the fact that we are recognizing the lack of caregiving support has the potential for having a kind of policy agenda that would really bridge right and left. Uh, an agenda that had things like child allowances, for example, or family support, or you could have the equivalent of a child allowance in the form of an elder allowance so that you could have someone get a specific uh, caregiving, um, both an obligation and also a salary if they committed to taking care of a particular um, elderly person. Another thing that I think has come through COVID is our physical environment keeps us from being able to have these kind of close care relationships. So the kids are in one place, the elders are in another place, the parents, the workplace is in another place, everyone's spending hours commuting back and forth. And I think one of the things we've realized is in a post-industrial world, we could have elders and preschools in the same place. We could do something like assign a grandmother to each early childhood class, for example. So have an older person who's 
got a salary to not be the teacher, but just to be the grandmother in that class, to just do that kind of caring. And it's that kind of specific local relationships that, that really underpin these relationships of care. So I think we could have a kind of family policy, but broadly construed, a family policy that would include, say, being able to commit to a friend uh, and have official recognition of the fact that you were taking care of that, uh, you were taking care of that individual person. And I think a policy like that would be very different from the way that we currently think about uh, we currently think about care, and would also be a policy that would really really bridge the divides, uh, the political divides. It's something that I think people on both sides of the spectrum could really be committed, uh, would could really be committed to, and would make an enormous difference. You were great. The challenge of that is in this partisan world, how do we not have care be partisan? And I, I'm sure that there's a way maybe tally through uh, agency and choice um, to do that. I want to, um, I've asked, uh, there's a Slido up right now that we've asked um, all of our participants to put their biggest takeaway from, from each of you. So while that um, slide is coming up, I'm going to ask you all to think about your last comment um, as we get to the the top of the hour here, by how time has gone quickly. Um, it's been a joy. About your last piece of advice or your last takeaway during this time. It can be personal, it can be systematic, it can be, it can be political. Um, so while we're, uh, Jessica is gonna gather some of those and send them to me. Um, Tally, what is your final sort of parting word to folks about joy and meaning making? Mm -hmm. I, I think um, that infection rates and mortality rates really hijack the attention of the public, the media and the people. And of course, you can see why. But I think even doing a, a pandemic, we really need to take into account and think about um, other things that matter, like the effect of isolation on people living alone or um, the effect of not having education and social connections on the young people. Um, and in order to be better at taking that into account in the future, I, need, I think we need to now start uh, developing ways to quantify those things, right? Quantify, how do you quantify lack of freedom? How do you quantify lack of education? Because we need to quantify them in order to then being able to take them into account and report them as we do GDP or mortality rates um, to make better decisions that will enhance people's welfare in the future. There's a lot I know at previous Davos, there's been a lot on the social progress index and alternatives to GDP. If you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. I'm sure Allison and, and the work you're doing on care, we need to put both the, the financial and non-financial um, burden and opportunity um, of that. So I think there's a there's a policy and political um, and economist um, um, call there. Alex, how about you in, in, in the last couple of minutes here, what is your big takeaway or call to action? Yeah, no, thanks Lisa. I mean, I think, for me, if we want to build cultures that we can be proud of, we need to do two things. We need to listen and we need to ask. Uh, gone are the days of command and control of leaders. I think the leaders, as proven during this year, those that listen, respect, apply, communicate, bond, keep people together, that's the way it goes. Uh, the second is if we want people to have a sense of inclusion, belonging, diversity, justice, we need to ask them, do they feel it? Do they see it? So, I mean, companies, organizations need to actually formally ask that. Simple questions, regular, whatever, to show that you care, if you will. So, I mean, listen and ask versus command and assume. Seems like great advice uh, before, during, and after any sort of crisis. Allison, um, last but not least, um, in this care revolution, those are my words, not you, yours, but maybe you would no, say that too. I like that. <laughs> I'll borrow Yeah, that. in this care revolution, um, what's your sort of final ask or call to folks? I think it's visibility. So care has been so central to human beings. I mean, literally, it's part of, it's what made us human, what made us evolve into homo sapiens. But, you know, there's the homo sapiens, but there isn't sort of the homo amor, the, the human who loves. And the human who thinks is just part of it. The human who loves and cares, that's really the thing that makes us human. And that's just been invisible in in policy because it's been something about women, it's been something about families, it's been something that's in the songs and sermons. And if you could take, you know, if you could take the song about what the world needs now is love and have it not just be a song, have it be a, a policy injunction, I think that would, I, I think COVID would have had a really positive effect in the long run. Well, we still can. Um, and at the top of the hour, I wanna thank you, Alex, Tally and Allison, not just for this session, but for your life's work. 
um, as we talk to the, the, the participants here, all of the folks listening um, have great insights and are living this personally and as leaders. They say their insight was to be kind. I think we knew that. Um, that we always continue to need to be this way. They've had increased consciousness of rethinking education um, and what we invest in. Um, this notion of mental health mattering, we talked about others and agency and listening and asking. Um, and with that, I wanna thank everyone who's joined. I hope you take care of yourself. You know, they say you have to put on your mask first before you can take care of others. Leadership is about that, is about um, taking care of yourself so you can help listen and ask and lead others.